I'm Nicola Talent and you're watching Crime World, a podcast about criminals, drugs and the underworld in Ireland and across the globe. Make sure you subscribe to our channel and turn on notifications so you can be the first to watch all our latest episodes. You can also listen wherever you get your podcasts. A Friday night roster in the Bolton Glass Garda station, 30 miles from Dublin and 15 from Carlow, generally involved sorting out drink-related brawls, but 10.30pm on February 11th, 2000, was one that Garda Peter Casson would never forget. He stared open-mouthed from behind the public hatch as two hunters dressed in combats and boots burst through the station doors, propping up a barefoot woman covered in blood and muck with a ligature wrapped around her neck. The woman looked like she'd been dragged along by the back of a moving car. Her puffy face was black, blue and bloodied. Her clothes were shredded. Any part of her body visible was covered in cuts and scrapes. Her knee was so badly skinned that the bone was a film of blood away. Her hair looked as if it had been backcombed. There was mortal terror in her eyes. And based on the primal sounds she was making and the skittish way she was shaking, it was with good reason. In contrast, the men's voices were high on adrenaline. They were talking rapidly and over each other. They'd found her for being strangled in the trunk of a car. She'd been raped. They knew the man involved. He was a local. His name was Larry Murphy. Jill was hysterical. Were they going to bring him here? Larry Murphy, was he coming back? Was he on the way? She'd get out before he came. Garda Casson promised her that that wouldn't happen. She was safe. He asked her who she'd like him to ring. I want my sister, Jill said. Garda Casson took Jill into the interview room. She was safe, he promised her. But her ordeal wasn't over. She'd need to make a statement. She could not go home yet or wash until her injuries had been photographed in the sexual assault unit of the Rotunda Hospital. Her clothing would need to be collected, packaged and labelled. Her pubic area combed in the hope some of the suspect's pubic hairs had cross-transferred to prove contact and her body had to be swabbed for deposits that could be compared to Larry Murphy's DNA. Jill understood she was willing to relive it all tonight if... She didn't, no other woman was safe. Garda Seamus Murphy got on the radio and organised backup from other stations, including two female officers to accompany Jill to the Rotunda in Dublin city centre. After several harrowing hours in the interview room, Jill's statement was read back to her. The full conversation had been edited back to the bare facts. There was no place in a court of law for descriptions of her feelings or the reassurances she needed that she was strong enough to do this, or how many times she needed to be told that she was safe now. There was nothing in the Garda training manual about how to stay clinically detached, having heard the horror this woman had been through either. As the statement concluded, Jill nodded that was what she'd said. She signed her name at the bottom. It meant she was going to have to see it through, probably come face to face with them again in a court of law. The pen shook as she wrote. His name still strikes fear across Ireland. A hunter who stalked his prey in the heart of the area known as the Vanishing Triangle. But where is Larry Murphy now? And why is he a suspect in the murder of teenager Deirdre Jacob and the mystery disappearance of Jojo Dullard and Annie McCarrick? Now, in a Crime World mini-series, we present Predator, Larry Murphy and Ireland's Missing Women, a chilling true crime special. This is Crime World, a podcast from sundayworld.com. At 8.20am the next morning, Larry Murphy answered his front door to seven Gardaí. Murphy had a licence for a shotgun and the Gardaí weren't taking any chances. Are you Larry Murphy? Detective Sergeant James Ryan from Carlow asked. I am. Larry turned his back and leaving the door ajar, walked into the living room. The seven Gardaí followed. Larry Murphy, DS Ryan said, 
I'm arresting you under Section 4 of the Criminal Justice Act for rape. You have the right to remain silent. Anything you say can and will be used against you in a court of law. You have the right to a solicitor. If you cannot afford a solicitor, one will be provided for you. Murphy gripped his head. I I don't know why it happened. I'm terribly sorry. What were you doing in Carlo? D.S. Ryan asked. I I was doing a house in Benakerry with my brother. He lowered his head and murmured, Why did I do it? When he looked back up, he asked, Can I speak to my wife? D.S. Ryan nodded and the seven guardie followed him down the hall. His wife gasped as he opened the bedroom door and she saw the guardie behind him. She was still in her pyjamas and just looked bewildered. He headed back out. She put her dressing gown on and quickly followed. Sit down, he told her as she arrived up. What's this about? I raped a girl last night, he said. His wife covered her mouth with both hands. We're here to arrest your husband, D.S. Ryan told her. She started to cry. Can I go to the bathroom to comb my hair, Murphy asked. D.S. Ryan gestured to one of the guardie to go with him. In the bathroom, Murphy leaned on the sink and stared at his reflection in the mirror. Why did I do it? He asked himself. D.S. Ryan was asking his wife where the gun was. In the bedroom, she sobbed through her tears. Larry arrived back in and said it wasn't there. He led two officers into the utility room and pointed to the top of a press. As they got it down, he turned and stared at his reflection in the window. I didn't need to do it, he said aloud, speaking to himself. Assistant Commissioner Tony Hickey was thin as a jockey's whip, with a shock of white hair, a dapper dress sense and a sort of terrier-like reputation for getting his teeth sunk into a case. He'd led the four-year investigation into the Veronica Guerin murder and was now the head of the Eastern Division with an office in Mullingar in County Westmeath. Briefed about events in Bolton Glass, his alarm bells had started to ring. The savagery and the brazenness of the abduction, the rape and the attempted murder suggested an accomplished killer. Hickey was head of Operation Trace, set up to trace, review and collate evidence on Ireland's missing women. Six women aged between 17 and 28 had disappeared in less than six years between 1993 and 1998. When a woman is raped or murdered, it's police procedure to look up similar offenders in the area. But if a killer is on the rampage who's never come up on the criminal radar before, it might be because he was an ordinary Joe. Just like Larry. Hickey picked up the phone and dialed the number of one of his right-hand men during the Girin investigation. Superintendent Gerry O'Connell was now based in the Trace office in Nace in County Kildare. You'll need to keep a watching brief on this one, Hickey explained. But keep an open mind. Early signs in Bolting Glass Station were that Larry might be on the verge of holding his hands up to his crimes. The atmosphere was on a knife edge as he emptied a pocket before his interview and placed £700 on the counter. The girl's money, he said. He put his hand in another pocket and pulled out £444. And that's mine. He removed his clothes so they could be forwarded to the forensic lab in Dublin for analysis, changing into a set that his wife had organised for him. They'd find the girl's handbag was in the back seat of his car, he said. But all hope... He was going to spare his victim any further trauma faded the second he got into the interview room. He was saying nothing without a solicitor present, he said. Larry had clammed up. If Larry Murphy was their man, it was the answer to the Operation Trace team's prayers in Superintendent Gerry O'Connell's view. The problem was that when it came to policing, he didn't believe in miracles. He briefed his hand-picked team on the inquiry taking place a 22-mile drive away in Bolton Glass. Listening intently to developments were Detective Inspector Mark Kerrigan of the old murder squad, now based in Carlow, Sergeant Pat Tracy, who'd worked on the case of the missing Rathfarnham schoolboy Philip Kearns in 1988, Detective Garda Alan Bailey of the Bridewell Station in Dublin, at the heart of the inner city, Detective Garda Marianne Cusack attached to the National Drugs Unit and involved in the prosecution of the man believed to have pulled the trigger on Veronica Guerin 
Eugene Duchy Holland. And finally, Detective Sergeant Maura Walsh of the National Bureau of Criminal Investigation. The order to assemble the unit had come from the top in September 1998, two months after a sixth woman vanished into thin air in less than six years. Uh, in July of 1998, uh, Deirdre Jacob disappeared from her ho- outside her home in Newbridge. Detective Garda Alan Bailey of the Bridewell Station. Up to that, there had been a lot of um, media interest in a number of other missing females. And I think it was because of the campaign mounted by some reporters describing us as having a vanishing triangle that that prompted the guard authorities to act. There were six on the eastern seaboard. They'd all been investigated, but investigated separately. And the concept of a, a team to take all the cases on board was unheard of up to that. So we were appointed, and the six was appointed, selected by the commission and appointed to review all six of the cases. Then Commissioner Pat Byrne had given instructions to put together a squad designed to find out if any or all of the women were the victims of the same serial killer. I mean, we, that's the one thing we warned in advance that we weren't to mention the word serial killer. What we're looking for is commonalities in the crime. Now, the thing about it is if you found a number of commonalities, you would then say to yourself, well, do we have a serial killer? But you still couldn't use that word. On the display board at the top of the room, the faces of the women in question stared back full of life. None of their bodies had ever been recovered. Victim one was an American waitress with long wavy brown hair bundled on the top of her head, last seen on a bus to an Ascari County Wicklow around 4pm after telling friends she was going for a walk. Annie Bridget McCarrick had disappeared on Friday, March 26th, 1993. Victim two was a freckle-faced lounge girl with a shy smile who'd vanished trying to hitchhike home after missing the bus. Jojo Dullard, 21, from Callan in County Tipperary, had disappeared in Moon in County Kildare sometime after 11.30pm on Thursday, November 9th, 1995, and was believed to have been later seen hitchhiking four and a half miles away in Castle Dermot in County Kildare. Victim three was a long-haired, blonde hairdresser and heavily pregnant mum-to-be, last seen in her bedsit. Fiona Pender was 25 years old and had disappeared from Tullamore County Offaly on Friday, August 23rd, 1996. Victim four was a baby-faced brunette who'd been the subject of a previous missing persons inquiry after running away. Fourth student, Kira Breen, was only 17 when she disappeared for good on Thursday, February 13th, 1997, after sneaking out of her bedroom window. Victim five had the look of a rock chick with long brown hair and a tattoo on her right arm. Fiona Sinnott from Wexford was the only mother among the missing girls and had vanished from the house she was renting near Rosslare, County Wexford, on Sunday, February 8th, 1998. Fiona had been the subject of previous violent attacks before she vanished. Victim six had rosy cheeks and a black bob and had disappeared walking back to her parents' house in Newbridge, County Kildare. 18-year-old Deirdre Jacob was studying in St Mary's Teacher Training College in Twickenham, London. She was home for the holidays and due to start a receptionist job when she had disappeared on Tuesday, July 28, 1998. There were commonalities insofar as some disappeared at night time, some disappeared in the daytime, some disappeared out on the road, you know. But there weren't enough, there weren't sufficient to suggest that it was somebody uh, stalking the roads looking for victims. In three of the cases, we were satisfied beyond all doubt that the, the murderers, and we were taking them as murder, although they weren't officially listed as murderers, but that the murderers were known to the victims. That's the case of uh, Fiona Sinner of Kira Breen and of Fiona Pender. And we had no doubt that the, the, the perpetrators of their murders were known to them. Then the other three were Annie McCarrick, Georgia Dullard and Deirdre Jacob. Annie went missing in the afternoon uh, up in the Wicker Mountains. Georgia would go missing late at night, at half eleven at night, down in County Kildare. And then Deirdre Jacob went missing, but it was half three in the fine sunny afternoon. It didn't tend to suggest that somebody was out stalking the roads looking for victims. But then you said to yourself, they did all go missing whilst out on the main road, you know. 
Annie, Jojo and Deirdre were all walking alone when they disappeared and within a 30 mile radius of each other around the Wicklow, Carlow, Kildare borders. Since research suggested serial killers always operated in or around work or home, territory where they can disappear quickly, the superintendent turned to an ordnance survey map of the area that was pinned to the top wall. He traced an imaginary line with his finger that ran east to west from Enniskerry to Newbridge, then headed south to Castle Dermot, where it moved back up again in north-easterly direction to Enniskerry. The shape was an almost perfect triangle around the Dublin Wicklow Mountains, on the edge of which Larry Murphy lived. On the ground in Balting Glass, the detectives working the checkpoints had just relayed another strand of circumstantial evidence back to the incident room. Larry had been schooled in Skull Cunglas in Balting Glass. One of his classmates had since been convicted of the brutal rape and murder of civil servant Marilyn Wrynn. David Lawler, a telecom engineer who raped and strangled his victim, was reputedly a friend and distant cousin of Larry Murphy. Lawler had strangled 41-year-old Marilyn after following her from the Nightlink bus as she made her way home from her office Christmas party in 1995. He dragged her into the bushes from a dark path in the sprawling suburb of Blanchardstown, West Dublin. Her battered body lay frozen in the undergrowth by the Tolka River for more than two weeks before it was found. The Operation Trace incident room was buzzing with talk of the similarities between both men and the crimes they'd committed. Lawler was also a father with a skilled job as a telephone technician and was also harbouring a secret life. Both men's wives were pregnant when they raped their victims in lonely wastelands. Neither had previous convictions and neither was known to Gardaí. The information from the ground was that the pair had socialised and worked together. It begged the question, could they have ever targeted a woman together? The information was forwarded to NACE. By 2.30pm, having conferred with his solicitor, Larry began to give his version of events. He'd gone into Carlo for chips, he told his interviewers, Inspector Patrick Mangan and Detective Garda Mark Carroll, who were hanging on his every word. I was walking down the path and I seen this girl walking towards me, he said, speaking in a flat tone without making eye contact. I'd never met the girl in my life. I don't know what came over me. I just flipped. I said to her, give me the money. And she said, fuck off. I hit her then. She'd stopped to open the door of her car and I hit her with my hand on the side of the face. She stumbled back onto the seat in the car. I pushed her over to the other seat, to the passenger seat. I asked her where the keys were and I found her keys on the seat. I moved her car over to where mine was. She was sitting in the car beside me with her head on my knee. At that stage, I tied her arms. I asked her to remove her bra. I used the bra to tie her arms and I took her out of the car. She walked out. I told her to get in the boot of my car and she sat in. At this stage, I took off up the road. I don't know why I did it. I don't know. I suppose I drove for about 20 minutes. I travelled out the Athai road and I stopped at a lane. I raped her. First, I took her out of the car and I put her in the seat. I removed her trousers and I I just raped her. When I stopped the car the second time, I took her out and sat her in the car. She started talking to me and I told her I had two kids and she said she'd like to have kids herself someday. She asked me to take her home and said she'd do anything I wanted if I took her home. I told her I would leave her home and she told me she'd like to make love to me. I'd sex with her then, but that was her own choice. We made love in the car. I didn't try to kill her at all. I'd sex in two places with her, but the second time was her own choice. Inspector Mangan and Detective Garda Carroll glanced at each other in in pure disbelief. Murphy had just thrown a huge spanner in the works. If a jury at any future trial thought the victim was consensual, had made love to him of her own volition, it might muddy his earlier admission. And if a rape charge couldn't be made stick, they'd no chance of proving attempted murder. There was now a real danger the case against Larry Murphy might never get to court. In Nace, the trace team were frantically reviewing what they knew about Annie, Jojo and Deirdre, looking for any parallels. The day that Larry Murphy 
in terms of for the first time, is a huge development for us in our investigations. Because here we have what we all suspected may have happened, the almost perfect crime where a girl is snatched off the side of the road and never seen again. Were it not for the actions of the two men who were that night that Larry Murphy abducted the girl down in Carlo, that, that found her in the wood and had stopped where another car might have driven by, they actually stopped to see what was going on. Another five minutes, she would have been dead, and we, we'd sit, we'd be looking for another girl, sort of thing, you know. I was at home, and you know, get ready to go to work in the morning, and about half eight, I'm not sure, not 11, under 12 that day, so I'm dawdling, and I said, get a phone, I'll get down now. Uh, he'd been arrested early that morning, and um, we hadn't been consulted, we weren't told. Now, I feel we should have been. I think we should have been there from the get go. You know, even to go into the house to arrest him, his demeanour when he was arrested, all that was very important to us because here he is. This, this is what you're looking for, you know. What you spent your two years investigating, it's leading to this. At the stage we were brought into the case, the investigator had moved on quite a bit. And Larry had been arrested, was being interviewed, and interview teams had been set up and they were in and out with him. So, um, you only had your 12 hours to, in, to interview him properly. The, the case he was arrested for was a cut and dried. It was an open and shut case, you know, and he had no problems with putting his hand up that he did it and he was caught in the story, you know. So there was a stage when you had that boxed away where you could have said, look, we're investigating these other cases, either were you, did you, were you part of it or do you know anything about it or is there something you can tell us? Given your modus operandi in that particular case, it's obviously that you knew what you're doing. So are we looking in the wrong direction when we're looking at these disappearances? Is it something else we should be looking for? You know, to ask him, he's the, he's the expert. Annie had grown up in Long Island, New York, the only child of John, a teacher and later a police officer, and Nancy, a school secretary, both of which were of Irish descent. Annie had fallen in love with Ireland after a trip in 1987 and had been living and studying in Ireland on and off for several years before her disappearance in 1996. She'd read English, German and sociology at St. Patrick's College in Maynooth, renting a cottage in Ballyboden, Rathfarnham. And she studied teacher training in St. Patrick's College, Drumcondra in Dublin, working as a junior assistant teacher in Our Lady of Victories in Ballymun. She had a wide circle of Irish friends and had travelled to Hamburg in Germany with them to work during the summer holiday. They described her personality as friendly and trusting. She'd moved home to New York to take a master's in English, but she'd come back to Ireland for good in January 1993. At first, when she returned, she'd stayed with an ex-boyfriend's brother and his fiancé at Cherrywood Avenue in Clondalkin. But once she'd found her feet, she'd moved to an apartment in St. Catherine's Court in Sandymount with two other women. She was working as a part-time waitress in Café Java in Leeson Street and was on a day off on the day she disappeared, though she was due in to collect her wages later that evening. When her flatmates last saw her, she was sitting on her bed knitting. They were heading down the country for the weekend and they said goodbye to Annie around 9am. Two hours later, Annie was in Superquin in Sandymount buying groceries. The till receipt recorded the time of the transaction as 11.02am. She was wearing a dark tweed thigh length jacket, jeans and brown cowboy boots. She had a long gold necklace with a pink heart and a crucifix around her neck and a signet ring and her grandmother's wedding band on her finger. Next, she went to the AIB in Sandymount to transfer her account from the Clondalkin branch to her new address. CCTV footage captured her there 11 days earlier in the same coat. A couple of phone calls revealed what she'd in store for the weekend. She phoned a friend, Anne O'Dwyer, to see if she wanted to go for a walk to Enniskerry in County Wicklow. And then the couple she'd lived with, ex-boyfriend's brother, Hilary Brady, and his fiancée, Rita Fortune, to invite them over for dinner the following night. Annie's mother was due over to visit the following Thursday, so the next weekend was sorted. She'd already bought the theatre tickets in anticipation. The weather was dry and fine, but Anne O'Dwyer wasn't able to go for the walk because she'd hurt her foot. Hilary and Rita said they'd love to see her Saturday night. Before heading out, 
Annie did some housework. She put a load on in the washing machine in the basement of the building, washed some dishes and left the apartment at around 3.15pm. She caught the number 18 bus from Sandymount to Ranelagh, which she had to sprint to catch. The driver had slowed down for the tall, striking American. In Ranelagh, she'd stood in the bus queue opposite the Ulster Bank for the number 44 bus that went to Enniskerry. The time was just before 4pm. One of the girls on the bus, Emer O'Grady, recognised Annie as she got on. They'd worked together in the courtyard restaurant in Donnybrook. Annie climbed the stairs and sat on the top deck, while Emer stayed downstairs because her stop was only a few away in Milltown. None of the passengers or the driver remembered if Annie definitely got off in Enniskerry or got off at any of the stops in between. The next possible sighting placed her in the post office in Enniskerry. A woman working in the post office thought that she had maybe sold stamps to someone matching Annie's description. But this was as far as the investigation could track her definite moments. In all probability, it was Annie in the post office. She'd said she was going to Enniskerry and she was the kind of girl to keep in touch. But it wasn't a positive sighting like Emer O'Grady had given because she knew Annie. Two doormen in Johnny Fox's pub in Glen Cullen, four miles from Enniskerry, believed that Annie had been there that night. They said she was with a young man who paid £2 cover charge for them to see the jolly ploughmen playing in the lounge. He was described as being in his mid-twenties, clean-shaven, of average build and with dark brown hair. And the time? Around 9.30pm. The Johnny Fox's pub angle had really raised more questions than it had answered. What had Annie done for the four hours in between the post office sighting in Enniskerry if it was her that was in the post office? Would she have walked the narrow mountainous road to go to a pub in Glen Cullen alone and in the dark? Did she get a lift? If it was her, who was the man she was with? Had they arranged to meet? And why did he never come forward? Why also did Annie abandon her plan to collect her wages at Cafe Java later that evening? All these questions were unanswered. Further queries led to a belief that another American woman who looked a little like Annie might have been the one in the pub that night. And despite appeals, this woman never came forward and nor did the man reported to have been with her. At about 8pm the following night, her friends Hilary and Rita arrived at Annie's apartment as arranged. But nobody answered. They couldn't remember Annie's phone number so they rang her parents to get it but there was still no answer. The next day, Sunday, the couple still couldn't get an answer from Annie's apartment. They called into Cafe Java where staff explained she hadn't showed up for work the day before. When the phone in Annie's apartment was finally answered, Annie's flatmate said she wasn't there. Hilary and Rita phoned Annie's parents again to say nobody knew where she was. Jojo Dullard's background was completely different. The 21-year-old was from a farming background and had lived in Callan in County Kilkenny. Her father, John, died when her mother, Nora, was pregnant with her and her mother died when Jojo was nine. Jojo had four brothers and sisters and she lived with her elder sister Kathleen who was 10 years her senior in the family home. When Kathleen married her boyfriend Seamus Bergen a couple of years later, Jojo moved in with them. She stayed with them until she was 16 before moving in with another sister Mary and her husband Bernard Phelan. At 19, Jojo had moved to Dublin with her friend Mary Cullinan to study beauty therapy. The pair found the cost of materials for the course and supporting themselves too expensive and dropped out, opting instead to get bar work. They planned to save enough to go back to the course and for two years lived together at addresses in Dolphins Barn, Fibsborough and Rialto. Jojo's last pub job in Dublin was in the Red Parrot in Dorset Street, but when she got a job in Dawson's Bar back in Callan, eight miles southwest of Kilkenny, she decided to move back, lining up a flat for herself in the town. She'd one long-term boyfriend, an American called Mike, who was travelling around the world when he met her and had continued his travels since. He'd met Jojo in Dublin and she'd brought him down to meet her family. She was reportedly broken-hearted when they broke up. On her last day, 
Thursday, November 9th, 1995, she travelled to Dublin to collect her last dole payment at Harold's Cross. Then she met some friends in Bruxelles off Grafton Street for a drink. She'd missed the bus back to Callan, so she got a bus to Nace instead and started hitching from there. Her first lift dropped her five miles farther down the road at Kilcullen in County Kildare and a second got her from there to Moon in County Kildare. She was still more than 40 miles from home, but only 10 from Carlow Town where she'd a friend and she could have stayed the night. It was dark and cold when Jojo reached Moon. She was wearing a zip-up black cotton jacket, blue jeans and boots. The man who gave her the lift from Kilcullen dropped her at the phone box in Moon where she rang her pal Mary Cullinan and told her how she'd missed the bus. The time was 11.37pm. Jojo thumbed passing cars with one arm out the door while talking to Mary. She cut off the conversation to say a car had stopped, ran over to it, then ran back to tell Mary she'd got a lift and had to go. Four witnesses would later report having seen a woman hitching a lift in Castle Dermot, County Kildare, four and a half miles south of Moon, at about 11.55pm, heading in the Carlow direction. The description and the time this woman were seen was consistent with Jojo's last words to Mary, suggesting she'd made it as far as Castle Dermot, although the third person who'd picked her up never came forward despite appeals. But the case of 18-year-old Deirdre Jacob was the most elusive of all because she was seen so many times in her last known minutes. The student teacher was home in Newbridge for the holidays in July of 1998 and about to start a job as a part-time receptionist. She walked from her home in Rosebury on the Barrettstown Road on the outskirts of the town into the centre at around 1pm on July 28th. She was wearing a navy Nike jumper with a white collar, blue jeans and blue Nike runners and she was carrying a black bag with a distinctive CAT logo. She went to the bank and cashed a cheque for £280 sterling. She was captured on CCTV at 2.22pm. She went to the post office to post a bank draft for her fees for the following term, along with some letters, and then she called in to see her granny at 2.30pm. She was seen walking home along the Barrettstown Road by several witnesses, the last of whom placed her only 300 yards from her own front door. Then, just like the others, nothing. So if you have a body, you have the potential for evidence. Our victims disappear from off the face of the earth, basically. When you're investigating a missing person case, you're all the time looking for this, what's called a push-pull factor. You know, there's something draw her away from the house, like she fell in love and ran away, or does something push her away from the house, as in, was there abuse of some sort going on in the house? Was it an abusive relationship? So you look for any of those and certainly in neither of those cases did we find any suggestion of anything like that. So you're saying to yourself then, well, obviously it's the worst case scenario, you know, and that's a, a stranger abduction. Deirdre went missing from outside her own front door at three o'clock on a lovely August or July afternoon. Her mother arrives home at five o'clock. Deirdre's not in the house, so immediately the mother begins to start worrying. I mean, you know, Deirdre's a teenager, why would she? But that was the sort of relationship they had and that was the sort of girl she had. And by seven o'clock, mother and father were down to the local guard station reporting her missing. But Annie McCarrick and his mother was due to fly in from America on the following Monday. And she went missing on a Friday afternoon, so she certainly had no reason to go missing. And with Jojo, she was out of state starting a new life for herself down in Cattle and County Kilkenny and was down there with friends and had a little job for herself, so she was quite content. You know, again, nothing or to suggest that there's any reason why she'd leave home or had been driven from home. There were air punches of victory as the trace team discovered in the files their very first strong lead. Larry Murphy had been nominated as a suspect in one of the women's cases. A sergeant had nominated him after Jojo's disappearance because he was a local and he'd a reputation for violence towards women. 
After some more inquiries, Trace discovered Larry was living in Castle Dermot with his wife at the time, the same location where Jojo was believed to have continued hitchhiking. The incident room to investigate her disappearance was the same one in Bolton Glass, now set up to deal with the rape inquiry. The phones in Bolton Glass station were hopping. People were coming out of the woodwork with stories about Larry Murphy in the community. The hardcore porn movies he liked to rent, the lewd stares that unnerved countless women in pubs, how he'd driven up behind a female motorist and tried to drive her off the road. One tip led to the most unlikely of places, a female friend of Larry's wife. The woman was happy to cooperate. She hated Larry Murphy, she said. It was a Sunday evening in 1996, she remembered. Larry and his wife were living in Ballinacarrig, Castle Dermot at the time. She and his wife had been chatting in the kitchen when he arrived home. He'd been drinking and he wanted them to join him for some more. His wife didn't want to go and the woman who was in her mid-twenties at the time had no interest. But Larry kept at her. She was on her way home to meet her boyfriend, she said, trying to put him off. The woman stopped talking. The detective stopped writing and he looked up. He could tell the story was getting more difficult for her. She was wringing her hands and her eyes had filled. Go on, love, he encouraged. Larry offered me a lift home, she said. She'd climbed into his car. What kind of car was it, do you remember? She'd been wearing a T-shirt and shorts, she said, sounding apologetic. When they got to her junction, Larry kept going, just drove straight on by. She kept asking him what he was doing, but... He was driving like a madman. He continued on a few hundred yards and turned right into the lane, which is the back entrance to a farm, she explained. Suddenly, he pulled in and he put his left arm around her shoulder and his right hand on her leg. She told him she wasn't interested, but Larry wasn't taking no for an answer. She'd pushed him back. She shook her head. He grabbed me with both hands around the throat and pushed me down towards the front seat of the car. He said nothing. His expression had totally changed on his face. It was a side of him I'd never seen before. I got my hand on the door handle beside me and broke his grip on my neck. I jumped out of the car and I ran back along the lane towards the main road, she told the officer. It was after eight in the evening, but it was still bright, she went on. Larry sprinted after her. He caught up with her, grabbing her from behind. She was terrified, she said, but he started pleading with her. Please don't tell my wife. He was trying to attack her. He was trying to get out of what he'd done. That look on his face had gone and his face was kind of normal again. After much persuading, she'd agreed to let him drive her home. She was going to have to trek and hitch otherwise and it was a case of better the devil you know. Once there, she ran to the bathroom and locked the door. He followed and was banging on it to open up. He wanted to talk to her, he said. That's when his wife arrived, unexpectedly looking for him. When the woman heard her friend's voice, she came out, she said, and met her in the kitchen. What happened, his wife asked, shocked at the sight of her. The woman said she was still crying. And Larry came straight out with it. He said to her he'd grabbed me. I guess I didn't give him time enough to squeeze my throat further as I'd pushed him away immediately and jumped out of the car. After that, I hated Larry, she said. Larry Murphy, he had no previous convictions, he had no criminal convictions, but he was a sort of lad that everybody knew you don't be on your own with him. Especially the, the women knew, you know. He's not a nice person. And it's the way he'd look at them and the way he'd kind of spend the night kind of looking down. If you were down sitting there, he'd look at you. You know what I mean? So people were very wary of him. We were hearing all these sort of rumours about him going out with girls and maybe... He kind of stalking around the pub late at night if some girl was there and she was a bit too f- drunk or something like that, that the locals would always be watching because Larry is hovering, you know, and Larry was selecting his victim. And there were stories, legendary stories about him groping at girls that he was supposed to be helping up off the ground or helping out the door. And So as I say, he was legendary, but he had no criminal convictions. And then there's a downside to that also in that we, were, we continued with Operation Trace with our inquiries, but you were met with, sure, you know who it is. You know, you have the man, what more do you want, you know? I mean, I say, I say Larry in the pub was kind of shunned, but he was shunned if I was there with my wife, 
But maybe it's more like Larry comes in on his own. Larry was the hard man. Maybe some lads kind of shared little moments with Larry that they wouldn't admit to after, you know. Superintendent O'Connell brought a stack of files containing summaries of the missing women's cases on a visit to the UK's National Crime Faculty in Brams Hill College in Hampshire. With him was Detective Garda Alan Bailey. They planned to use the facilities there at the forefront of groundbreaking research into geographic profiling. The theory that criminals reveal who they are and where they live, not just from how they commit their crimes, but also from the locations they choose. The idea was based on an assertion by a Canadian cop, Kim Rossimo, that human beings build their work and hobbies around their home in the same way lions hunt for prey at watering holes because they know old, young or injured animals will come there to drink. Rossimo had correctly predicted that a number of prostitutes and drug users going missing from downtown Eastside Vancouver, an area synonymous with crime and deprivation in the city, were all the victims of a serial killer. These were murdered women. You don't need a dead body on the ground to know these were murder cases, Rossimo had said. Time would prove him right, but in 1998 he'd been demoted for putting out a press release stating as much. His recommendation that one suspect, a man named Robert Picton, be put under surveillance fell by the wayside as the case became bogged down in institutional and professional jealousy. Racimo's geographical profiling unit was disbanded. The number of missing women linked to the same area of Vancouver would later rise to 61 Meanwhile, the FBI and Scotland Yard had been developing his theory about serial killers. The essence of geographic profiling was to go beyond the dots on the map to understand the significance of the place for the killer, the meaning to him of the places where he finds, kills and dumps victims. Larry Murphy picked his hunting ground. He was well known as a hunter and a good hunter, they say as well. I mean, Larry wasn't just a rabbit man, I always feel, but he certainly was known as a good, prolific hunter. You're concerned that he, he knew the, the area. He certainly knew he picked his operation ground in that he would have known the, all the country that, that well, all that area very well. He was very close to his own house, but he was also very close to um, where he used to hunt himself. And uh, he had, in the trees, some distance from where the crime would occurred. He had, there was a hunter's hide built into the tree. This is a platform built up in the tree where the hunter would go up and sit for hours and watch for whatever he's hunting for. There was one of those quite close by. And in one sense, you're saying to yourself, was Larry, did Larry select that particular spot to bring his victim to that in the fullness of time he could go back and sit up above in his, on his throne in the tree and look down? And the collection is as important as the actual crime itself. So you're saying to yourself, he will relive the crime. And we're better to do it than almost back raised at scene. There were whoops of delight in the incident room in Bolton Glass when news broke that they'd found a witness who'd seen Larry in the car park five minutes before he'd snatched Jill. A woman remembered checking her watch as she climbed into her car and so was certain the time was 8.10pm. She was a civil servant and had seen a man behaving strangely, sitting opposite her in his car, a blue Fiat Punto, Larry's. Something about him wasn't right, she recalled. He kept putting his head down and raising it again for another look at me. He made her really nervous. So she checked her mobile phone was on and then took off. The woman's information meant Larry had been lying in wait showing premeditation, and that directly contradicted with his own spur-of-the-moment version of events. In NACE, the trace detectives were working round the clock comparing records of every car that had ever been registered to Larry Murphy, with any witness sightings of vehicles seen in the vicinity of Moon on the night Jojo disappeared. The biggest problem was locating the information buried in the mountains of paperwork. Leave was effectively cancelled as they worked, even at full capacity, they were pressed to the collar. None of the detectives wanted to let the inquiry lose the new sense of momentum. You'd have had to be made out of stone not to feel the agony of the families trying to grieve without a body. 
A year after Jojo's disappearance, her brother-in-law, Martin Phelan, marched into the mayor's office in Kilkenny and climbed on a glass table. He'd spent 15 minutes shouting that she deserved better and that somebody had to start taking the case seriously. The then mayor was John McGuinness, who at that point became one of the family's biggest supporters. When Jojo's family wanted to erect a memorial stone at the phone box in Moon, but some locals objected in case it gave a negative impression of the village, John McGuinness, Martin Phelan and his brother travelled together to the site at 5am one morning in 1998 with a cement mixer and an engraved stone. They cemented the stone against the wall beside the phone box before anyone was even up or the talk got around to planning permission. It read, Jojo Dullard, missing since November 9th, 1995. What happened to her? Where is Jojo now? The stone was still in place. The incident gave a sense of the family's terrible frustration. The trace team were looking for one car in particular. The two tourists who'd given Jojo lifts in Nace and Kilcullen had come forward, but whoever drove her from Moon to Castle Dermot was unknown. It seemed reasonable to assume it must have been Jojo hitching in Castle Dermot since no other woman ever came forward to say she'd been hitching at the same time in the same direction that night. But why had the motorist who dropped her there not broken his silence? There'd been a lead that she'd made it that far. A farmer had found a woman's watch in a ditch in Castle Dermot. Jojo's sister remembered her getting a watch as a present from her ex-boyfriend Mike. The original inquiry had tracked the American down to Spain, but when showed the watch, he just couldn't remember if it was the same one. Of most significance was the statement of a taxi driver who'd come forward in February 1997, a year and three months after Jojo disappeared. He said he was driving along the main Waterford Road at Kilmacow, three miles north of Waterford and 50 miles from the phone box in Moon. It was about 1.20 a.m. on November 10th, 1995, less than two hours after Jojo had disappeared. He said he saw a red car parked on the side of the road and a man urinating beside it. Suddenly, a woman had burst out of the left-hand rear door and started to run. She was in her bare feet. A man jumped out of the back of the car and ran after her, grabbing her by the hair. He'd put both arms around her to restrain her as he lifted and dragged her back to the car, which then took off in the direction of Waterford. The detectives were also trying to establish if Larry Murphy had been driving a red car in 1995 when they discovered he had scrapped a perfectly good car in an illegal dump around Christmas of that year. What had he been driving when Jojo disappeared? In the interview room in Bolton Glass, Inspector Mangan was keeping the pressure on, trying a different tack. There was no consistency in the courts when it came to the sentencing of sex offenders. And some rapists even walked away with a suspended sentence and never served any jail time at all. What they needed was an attempted murder charge. But as it was, Murphy was trying to worm out of the rape charges. Did Larry understand the effect of what he'd done on his victim? Mangan asked. Did he realise how she'd suffered and that she'd probably never get over it? Cold blue eyes rolled up for the first time since the interview started. Well, she's alive, isn't she? Murphy answered. The National Bureau of Criminal Investigation in Harcourt Square was notified of developments in Bolton Glass. The nerve cell of the war on serious crime had subsumed the old murder squad in 1997. Among its rank were some of the most sophisticated and highly trained interrogators in the force. If anyone could get Murphy to crack, it would be one of them. Chief Superintendent Sean Cammon headed the unit. He wanted the torture to end for the missing women's families more than anyone. His niece was one of them. 25-year-old Fiona Pender was seven months pregnant when she disappeared on August 22nd, 1996. The blonde part-time model and hairdresser had vanished from the bedsit she shared with her boyfriend, John Thompson. The couple had met through Fiona's elder brother, Mark. Both men were interested in motorbikes, though Mark had died in a tragic accident on his in June 95. He had only been 21 and had a three-year-old son. John and Fiona were going out since October 1993 and had moved to London where they'd worked in a hotel together before returning home. 
John was the only son of a Protestant farmer. And when they moved back, he'd gone back to farming, moving into a bedsit with Fiona in the town and spending the days working with his father. Fiona tried to learn about the farming life. She bought a bull for the farm and wanted to get engaged and married and to find a new place to live before the baby was born. Two months to the day before her due date, she and her mum Josephine, Sean Cammon's sister, had gone shopping in the bridge centre in Tullamore. Josephine bought the baby a grey tracksuit and Fiona bought baby wipes, gripe water and soother cream. Her only living brother, John, was 13 at the time and he joined them, walking Fiona back to her flat in Church Street with his mum. It was only a couple of minutes away from the shopping centre, but Fiona was never seen again. John Thompson says he said goodbye to her on Thursday morning, August 22nd, leaving for work on the farm early. A friend who knocked her door on Friday morning got no answer and neither did Josephine, who called later in the day. When still she couldn't find or contact Fiona on the Saturday, Josephine first contacted John Thompson, who said he thought Fiona was with her. And then she notified Gardy. Three years and six months later, her uncle, Sean Cammon, dispatched two officers to assist with the Larry Murphy inquiry in Bolton Glass. In the UK, the opinion of the geographic profiling experts was that Larry Murphy was more likely to have killed the victims nearest to him. In order of likelihood, that meant Jojo, Deirdre and Annie. Now the Super and Alan Bailey were availing of another computer programme available in Brams Hill called Viclass, the Violent Crime Linkage Analysis System a database of all sexual and violent offenders in Scotland Yard with details of how they'd attacked. One of the cornerstones of the definition of a serial killer was that a method was always used. For instance, Wayne Gacy, who raped and murdered 33 young men and boys in the United States between 1972 and 1978, had the trademark of gagging victims with their own underwear so that they would die in their own vomit. A description of what Larry Murphy had done during the rape was fed into the system. The result took everyone by surprise. Not one other sex offender recorded on the database showed up as having used the same modus operandi. The bra around the victim's wrists and the bag over her head is as good as your man's signature, the expert concluded. The hairs on the back of Superintendent O'Connell's neck bristled. Twelve years earlier, He'd been part of a murder inquiry involving a woman who'd been found with a plastic bag over her head, with her bra tied around her neck, and who'd been dumped in the Dublin Wicklow Mountains. That case was unsolved. In 